It's a big stage, a lot of people. How are you all? Good to see you all. Thank you so much for having us here today. I know this is a TEDx faux pas or a TED faux pas, but I have cards and I'm going to use them. And uh, hopefully they guide me through this talk. Um, but man, what a day to be here. It's sunny outside, the new Kobo Hall. This place is amazing. And I'm um, very, very excited to be here again. Um, you know, Detroit's a city that's abuzz with, with uh, innovators. It's abuzz with artists. It's, it's, it's abuzz with people that are making a change. And um, we're very fortunate to be part of that. Um, I never imagined myself being on this stage. Um, and still don't right now in this second. Um, so anyway, my name is Jacques Panisse, and I'm a team member of a new company here in Detroit called Shinola. Um, some of you uh, might have heard of our company, but a large majority of you probably haven't heard of our company. And um, most of you might have heard of a saying that goes something like this, you don't know shit from Shinola. Um, at Shinola, we're attempting to reintroduce manufacturing at scale in the United States. Um, more specifically, we're doing it here in Detroit. There's a great, great quote um, that I can't see. Is it on the screen? There we go. Sorry, is it there now? So there it is. All right, cool. So we got it. If people aren't telling you that your idea is crazy, then it is likely not a very good idea. And um, Francis Ford Coppola said that. And I don't know how many of you know this, but I, I didn't know this, but he is from Detroit, amazing human being. And I think that that speaks to, you know, what this city is all about, amazing people. Um, so let's look back to 2010, a few years ago. This country was in disarray. The big three had become the domestic three. The Great, or we were coming out of the Great Depression, or recession, sorry. We felt like the Great Depression, probably. Um, we were, companies were looking for ways to avoid bankruptcy, um, and the bad news was just all around us. Um, and so, would you all say that it was a good idea at that point to manufacture anything in this country? Um, people were telling us we were crazy. They were looking at us like we were crazy. And, no way was it a good idea. It was an insane idea. Um, consumer brand watches have not been made in this country in over 40 years. Next slide, there we go, it's working. Stoves haven't been made in this country in 20 years. And just a quick fact, I don't know if you realize it, but in the 1800s, Detroit was a stove-making capital of the world, which is fascinating to me. There was the Detroit, uh, excuse me, the International Detroler Corporation making cameras here in Detroit. Cameras have come and gone over the years. Elgin Watch Company haven't made watches in this country, again, in decades. But look at that timepiece. That is a piece of art. It's, a, it, it's an amazing, amazing piece of, of what this country stands for, which is craftsmanship and, and quality. Schwinn, bicycle company. Bicycles haven't been made in this country in over 20 years. And the bicycle industry went across the pond in the early 80s. And I don't want to forget this one quick industry. It's the American flag industry. Uh, the large majority of American flags are made in this country still today, which we're very fortunate for. But 6% of the flags, American flags that is, are made in China that are brought into this country. And I struggle with that, we struggle with that a bit, but nonetheless, um, the industry is threatened here in this country at some level uh, because of what's happening over there and they're, they're making those, those flags over in China. How many of you in this room would pay an extra few bucks for an American flag that's made in this country? I just wanna see. Good, it's good to know. So let's get into the why, right? Um, since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, America was known as the place for ideas, as the capital of manufacturing in the world. Eli Whitney, arguably the father of manufacturing, 
right? Modern day manufacturing, the cotton gin, um, you know, back in the early 1800s. Thomas Edison. I was sitting earlier wondering what Thomas Edison would think about these crazy red lights and these bright lights up on this stage. Henry Ford. I was thanking him earlier as I was driving here because Henry Ford is the father of Ford and I was driving a wonderful new uh, uh, Ford Explorer. The Wright brothers. Because of the Wright brothers, arguably, I was able to get on a plane and fly to Detroit last night so I could be here with you all today. <clears throat> so, what happened is, in our theory, our theory is that what happened in the late 1850s, manufacturers from around the globe started coming to the United States. And what they would do here is they would come and they would explore what we were up to in our factories. And they would learn our processes, and they would learn what we were doing, and they'd go back across the pond or to wherever they lived in, this, in the world, and they would perfect our processes, right? And they would apply cheaper labor costs to those processes. And they began manufacturing, they began taking over the manufacturing power of the, of the world. So to reduce our costs and increase profits, we Americans, we went offshore. And as a result, we got greedy and fat in America. Profits increased and quality slipped. We lost jobs and ultimately we obliterated the middle class of America. However, in the 90s, a shift began to happen. And in comes the information age. We began to see how things were made and we began to wonder how things were made. And I don't know if you remember, in the 90s, Nike and Kathy Lee Gifford, um, there were some images that came about because of the information age, that we were able to see children in sweatshops where our clothes and our shoes were being made. So not only did we question where things were being made, but we began to question what was in the things we were consuming. And these words here, gluten-free, fructose, high fructose corn syrup, non-GMO, those all became part of our vernacular. But what that did is it spawned opportunity, and opportunity became apparent. Manufacturing jobs may have left this country, but the people didn't, and I think you all attest to that. The talent didn't leave, and the ingenuity didn't leave. This is a wonderful quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson. Do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. And I think that that speaks to what's happening here in Detroit today. Despite everything I previously mentioned, a core group of us were sitting around and we wanted to figure out how to make something in this country again. We didn't know what to make. Were we gonna make toasters? Were we gonna make stoves? Were we gonna make, I don't know, speakers? Phones? We didn't know what we were gonna make. But we knew we wanted to make something we were passionate about. And we're passionate about bicycles and we're passionate about watches. Crazy, right? Watches, bicycles, how does that work together? As I mentioned, neither, neither category had been made in this country for decades. So now we had our products and we needed a name for the, co the company. We were sitting around a table one day and we were telling our idea to a buddy of ours and he looked at us and he said, you guys don't know shit from Shinola. And we said, thank you. Bam, there it was. There were high fives around the table, it was great. We had our company name. <clears throat> so we started out, this, the Shinola, the, the, that was the rebirth essentially of an old American brand. A brand that had lain dormant for about 40 years or more. Um, a brand that has history, a brand that has soul to it. A very, very powerful brand. A brand that has brand equity and a brand that resonates with people. So we had our brand name, we had our products, but then we needed to figure out where. Where do you go in this country to make stuff? You go to the city that started this country, Detroit. <laughs> so here we are in, uh, let me see, I might have missed a slide. Yeah, I think I missed a slide. There we go. Um, so now we're in 2011 and uh, people were still telling us we're crazy which we are. For months we talked about this storied American brand, the storied American city. We talked about the people. 
There's the city. That's the College for Creative Studies building. Sorry that I'm behind on my slides. I'm trying to keep up with all this. Um, we talked about local Detroiters. We talked about people from around the country, craftspeople that were coming in, people that could help pull this together and pull this off, right? And so to prove up our concept, we had to build a factory. And so we built a factory and began telling our story, the story of making quality goods at scale again in this country, and importantly, creating jobs. So the time came for us to launch our first product. And some of you might know about this story, but I'll tell it anyway. You know, we're a company out of nowhere with a crazy name, making stuff in Detroit. And we launched our first limited edition watch, and it sold out in eight days. And what we realized at that point was it wasn't just Detroiters supporting Detroit. It was a country supporting a movement. Um, and bringing jobs back to this country and producing quality goods. People want to support that, is what we learned. Another thing that we learned is that sometimes you cannot make things in this country. Take our shopping bag, for instance, our beautiful shopping bag. This bag cost $11 to make here in the United States versus $1 in China. We wrestled with this concept for quite some time. And unfortunately, it doesn't make business sense for us to produce these bags here in the US. It costs us about $46,000 a year. So what we did is we started the shopping bag fund. If you haven't heard of it, it's a very exciting fund. It's worth investing in. Talk to me after. Um, so the shopping bag fund. The shopping bag fund, what that is set up to do is it's a line item in our budget. And so every dollar that we saved in going offshore to buy our shopping bags goes into this fund and it helps us explore bringing manufacturing back to this country and how we can better the future of manufacturing in this country. So I'm just going to run through a few guiding principles that we learned along this way, along this journey, sorry. Think big. Think back to those quotes I said a couple minutes ago. In essence, Go left when everyone else is going right. And be crazy. The product is what your company sells, but the brand is what your company is about. Number two, be transparent and be honest. Think about Henry Ford. And I know that I'm over, but uh, I'll keep going here. Um, <laughs> think about Henry Ford. Henry Ford invited people into his factory to see what he was up to because Henry Ford's thought process was that in two weeks time, I'm going to be doing something completely different. I'm not going to be doing the same thing. So you can come see what I'm doing today. We are very transparent and we're very honest in what we do as well. In fact, we have a live factory cam that pumps content out to the web 24 by 7 that you can see on our website. Whatever you do, do it well. There's no substitute for quality and attention to detail. You've got one shot to make that first impression, and it's a very important impression, as we all know. In fact, we delayed our launch of our limited edition watches at a cost of a lot of dollars to make them perfect. Number four, have a purpose larger than profits. You must have passion for what you do. Our purpose is to create jobs, impact culture, and create community. So, a couple of years ago, at the height of the recession, Advertising Age ran an article, and it was titled, The Return of Integrity is the New Bottom Line for Marketers. The article cited a study by PricewaterhouseCoopers that launched a global call to action for business integrity as a C-suite and boardroom priority, putting integrity at the core of company's mission and making it a business issue, not a moral issue. The article asked how we should account for the feelings that employees have towards employers. Very important. What are the best ways to measure the bottom line impact of a partnership with a community organization? In this community, it's damn important as you all probably know. 
And the third question that I think is the most poignant and most powerful is, what is doing the right thing really worth? We believe regardless of what kind of products we make, this is the type of company that we're building here in Detroit today. So in closing, the challenge. We challenge you to make things here in America again. Some people think that the American label is just a bit of window dressing. We think differently, and other companies do too. Another quick example, their logo's not up here, but Whirlpool, 80% of the appliances that Whirlpool manufactures, or excuse me, sells in this country today are made in this country. Whirlpool, I don't know if you know that. Whirlpool also, for 20 years, donated all of the appliances that went into the Habitat for Humanities homes around this country, a fact that many don't know. Incredible American company. Thank you. It's not just big business, though, that's doing this. In a recent report from MIT, the U.S. landscape is no longer dominated by the larger firms. And I think Detroit is a great example of this. <clears throat> the larger firms are the ones that have every aspect of production themselves. That's no longer the future. The future is the smaller firms that may not always have enough money to train the workers commercialize new products, and procure their own financing. As I've said, our primary goal is to create jobs. We're doing that, and since opening, we've created 140 jobs. Large majority of those jobs are here in Detroit. Other jobs are in Dallas, New York, and we have some on the West Coast as well. The jury may still be out on the ability of American manufacturing to create jobs at scale again in this country. But the bottom line is we're doing it, and others are too. And there are a lot of you in this room. We don't believe that Detroit's best days are ahead. Excuse me, we don't believe. <laughs> Did I say that? We believe that Detroit's best days are ahead. And if we can do our small part, our small part, because it's going to take this entire community by making watches and bicycles in this, in this city, we can do anything. And I'm going to leave you all with this. To those of you that have written off Detroit, we give you the birdie. Thank you. <laughs>